Hey everybody, we are back from Mockingbird Chapter 22. I got a new shirt on now. Look at this one. It's an iron on. Somebody made it for me. Some wonderful student that I love very much. That I can't remember who it was. If it was you, thank you. <laughs> okay. Real courage, says Atticus. Real courage. All right. I have hair issues today. All right. I can't say that. This is forever going to be here. 22. 21 left off with the end, with the verdict. We got the verdict in 21. Um, we had the connection with the Mad Dog chapter and that Atticus showing physical courage here and he was able to save them or to protect them in this situation uh, to protect the community and his children from racism. He couldn't do it and he lost. Um, we saw Jem's reaction, which was very physical. We're going to get a lot more of Jem in this chapter. First line is hard for me to read. It just makes me sad every time. I wrote it on the top of my book right there. The first two sentences break my heart. Here we go. It was Jem's turn to cry. His face was streaked with angry tears as we made our way through the cheerful crowd. It ain't right, he muttered, all the way to the corner of the square where we found Atticus waiting. Atticus was standing under the streetlight, looking as though nothing had happened. His vest was buttoned. His collar and tie were neatly in place. His watch chain glistened and he was his impassive self again. It ain't right, Atticus, said Jim. No, son, it's not right. We walked home. Um, I want to talk about that first, the first two lines always in her chapters. Um, it was Jem's turn to cry. Uh, we saw Jem cry one other time. Do you remember? The tree, the knot hole, the cement. Um, his face was streaked with dirt, with, with uh, tears, and he was his face was dirty in all the right places. Although I had not heard him, um, and he cries at the cruelty of um, the Radleys uh, cutting off communication with Boo. And here we see Jem crying again, again at the same type of thing. Right? He cries at the cruelty. Um, ah. That's what moves Jem to tears. In both situations where we've seen him cry so far, is it's not a physical pain. It's not anything like that. It's always that cruelty. Um, notice angry tears and cheerful crowd. Notice that contrast, right? Tears are sadness and putting sadness and anger together. And then as he leaves, you have white folks celebrating um they're celebrating and so he, not only can he not believe that this is happening or that this took place and that it's not right but he's also dealing with people celebrating this as if it were a victory um, and that's just too much for him and me <laughs> and alexander was waiting up remember it's, it's also really late <coughs> Close to midnight. And Alexander was waiting up. She was in her dressing gown, and I could have sworn she had on her corset underneath it. I'm sorry, brother, she murmured. Having never heard her call Atticus brother before, I stole a glance at Jem, but he was not listening. He would look up at Atticus, then down at the floor, and I wondered if he thought Atticus somehow responsible for Tom Robinson's conviction. Wait, why do you think Jem won't look at Atticus? Like he's ashamed. He's so sad that this is the real world. Oh, every time. Is he all right? Auntie asked, indicating Jem. He'll be so presently, said, uh, said Atticus. It was a little too strong for him. Our father sighed. I'm going to bed, he said. If I don't wake up in the morning, don't call me. <laughs> That's funny. That's like the equivalent of an adult saying, I'm getting a drink. Like I, if it's over tomorrow, it's all good. I didn't think it wise in the first place to let them. This is their home, sister, said Atticus. Ha! Huh. We've made it this way for them. Might as well learn to cope with it. They might as well learn to cope with it. But they don't have to go to the courthouse and wallow in it. It's just as much Macon County as missionary tees. Atticus and Alexander's eyes were anxious. You were the last person I thought would turn bitter over this. I'm not bitter, 
Just tired. I'm going to bed. Atticus, Jem said bleakly. Mm. He turned in the doorway. What, son? How could they do it? How could they? I don't know. But they did it. They've done it before. And they did it tonight. And they'll do it again. And when they do it, it seems that only children weep. An English teacher. Huh. Good night. <sighs> okay. That's, at, that's Jem trying to make sense of this. But things are always better in the morning. <sighs> There's another little, sorry. There's another little Atticus wisdom there. But things are always better in the morning. Atticus rose as, at his usual ungodly hour and was in the living room behind the mobile register when we stumbled in. Jem's morning face posed the question his sleepy lips struggled to ask. It's not time to worry yet, Atticus reassured him as he went to the dining room. We're not through yet. There'll be an appeal. You can count on that. Gracious alive, Cal, what is all this? He was staring at his breakfast plate. Calpurnia said, Tom Robinson's daddy sent you along this chicken this morning. I fixed him. You tell him I'm proud to get it. I bet they don't have chicken for breakfast at, at the White House. What are these? Rolls, said Calperni. Estelle down at the local hotel sent them. Atticus looked up at her puzzled and said, You better step out here and see what's in the kitchen, Mr. Finch. We followed him. The kitchen table was loaded with enough food to bury the family. Hunks of salt pork, tomatoes, beans, even scupper nogs. Atticus grinned when he found a jar of pickled pig's knuckles. Reckon Auntie will let me eat these in the dining room? Calpurnia said, this was all around the back steps when I got here this morning. They, they appreciate what you did, Mr. Finch. They aren't overstepping themselves, are they? Almost. Atticus's eyes filled with tears. He did not speak for them for a moment. Tell them I am very grateful, he said. Tell them. Tell them they must never do this again. Times are too hard. So they're giving him food as a thank you. And Atticus is like, dude, they can't afford to do this. They need, like, they're giving so much of themselves. Like, it seems like a little, but in those times, that is more than they could really give. By they, I'm talking about the black folks out of appreciation. He left the kitchen and went to the dining room and excused himself to Aunt Alexandra, put on his hat and went to town. We heard Dill step in the hall, so Calpurnia left Atticus's uneaten breakfast on the table. Between rabbit bites, Dill told us of Miss Rachel's reaction to last night, which was, if a man like Atticus Finch wants to butt his head against a stone wall, it's his head. I'd have got her told. I'd have got her told, growled Dill, gnawing on a chicken leg. But she didn't look much like telling this morning. She said she was up half the night wondering where I was, Said she'd have had the sheriff after me, but he was at the hearing. Dill, you've got to stop going off without telling her, said Jem. It just aggravates her. Dill sighed patiently. I told her till I was blue in the face where I was going. She's just seeing too many snakes in the closet. But that woman drinks a pint for breakfast every morning. I know she drinks two glasses full. I've seen her. Don't talk like that, Dill, said Anna Alexander. It's not becoming to a child. It's cynical. I ain't cynical, Miss Alexandra. Telling the truth is not so cynical, is it? The way you tell it, it is. Jem's eyes flashed her, but he said to Dill, let's go. You can take that runner with you. When we went to the front porch, Miss Stephanie Crawford was busy telling, telling, telling it to Miss Maudie Atkinson and Mr. Avery. They looked around at us and went on talking. Jem made a feral noise in his throat. I wished for a weapon. <laughs> I hate grown folks looking at you, said Dill. Makes you feel like you've done something. Miss Motta yelled for Jem Finch to come there. Jem groaned and heaved himself up from the swing. We'll go with you, said Dill. Miss Stephanie's nose quivered with curiosity. She wanted to know who all, who all gave us permission to go to the court. She didn't see us, but it was all over town this morning that we were in the colored balcony. Did Atticus put us up there as sort of, was it right close up there with all those? Did Scout understand all the, 
Didn't it make us mad to see our daddy beat? Hush, Stephanie. Maudie's diction was deadly. I've gotten, I've got, I've not, I've not got all morning to pass on the porch. Jen Finch, I called to find out if you and your colleagues can eat, come eat some cake. Got up at five to make it, so you better say yes. Excuse us, Stephanie. Good morning, Mr. Avery. There was a big cake and two little ones on Miss Maudie's kitchen table. There should have been three little ones. It was not like Miss Maudie to forget Dill. And we must have shown it. But we understood when she cut from the big cake and gave the slice to Jem. So that's like her saying, okay, Jem, you're a big kid now. Like, you've seen this world for what it's really worth. You're, an, you're a grown-up now. You get it. As we ate, we sensed Miss Maudie's way of saying that was as far as she was concerned. Nothing had changed. She sat quietly in a kitchen chair watching us. Suddenly she spoke. Don't fret, Jem. Things are never as bad as they seem. Indoors, when Miss Maudie wanted to say something lengthy, she spread her fingers on her knees and settled her bridge work. This she did, and we waited. I simply want to tell you that there are some men in this world who were born to do our unpleasant jobs for us. Your father is one of them. Oh, said Jem. Well, don't you owe well me, sir, Miss Monty replied, recognizing James' fatalistic noises. You are not old enough to appreciate what I said. Jim was staring at his half-eaten cake. It's like being a caterpillar in a cocoon. That's what it is, he said. Like something asleep wrapped up in a warm place. I always thought Maycomb folks were the best folks in the world. At least that's what they seem like. We're the safest folks in the world, said Miss Maudie. We're so rarely called on to be Christians. But when we are, we've got men like Atticus to go for us. Okay, hold on. Jem says, I thought they were the best folks. And Miss Maudie says, we're the safest folks. We don't take risks. Sticking your neck out for a black man in that world was a risk. And even with a Christian background, as she mentions, were they weren't, most were not willing to take that risk. And those that they had Atticus to do that for them, right? Atticus was the one who could do that. And he kind of stood up for all of them or those that believed in Tom or believed in a fair trial. Jem grinned ruefully, which the rest of the county thought that. I hear she says this. You'd be surprised how many of us do. Who? Jem's voice rose. Who in this town did one thing to help Tom Robinson? Just who? His colored friends for one thing. And people like us, people like Judge Taylor, people like Mr. Heck Tate. Stop eating and start thinking, Jem. Did it ever strike you that Judge Taylor naming Atticus to defend that boy was no accident? That Judge Taylor might have had his reasons for naming him? This was a thought. Court-appointed defenses were usually given to Maxwell Green, Maycomb's latest addition to the bar, who needed experience. Maxwell Green should have had Tom Robinson's case. You think about that, Miss Marty was saying. It was no accident. I was sitting there on the porch last night, waiting. I waited and waited to see you all come down the sidewalk. And as I waited, I thought, Atticus Finch won't win. He can't win. But he is the only man in these parts who can keep a jury out so long in a case like that. And I thought to myself, well, we're making a step. It's just a baby step, but it's a step. Okay, hold on. So this should have been an easy verdict. A black man word, word versus the word of a white man or white woman either. Um, it should have been over immediately. Like we're not even going to think about this. Guilty. Done. But they were out a long time. What does that tell you? It wasn't an easy decision. They had to wrestle with it. Um, and that's what Miss Maudie is saying. Like, this should have been easy, but Atticus made them think. He made them walk in Tom Robinson's shoes. He made them have a conscience. And so even though they came back with the wrong verdict, it wasn't easy. This is Jem. It's all right to talk like that. Can't any Christian judges and lawyers make up for heathen juries? Jem muttered. Soon as I get grown, that's something you'll have to take up with your father, Miss Maudie said. Went down Miss Maudie's cool new steps in the sunshine and found Mr. Avery and Miss Stephanie Crawford still at it. They had moved down the sidewalk and were standing in front of Miss Stephanie's house. Miss Rachel was walking toward them. I think I'll be a clown when I get grown, said Dill. Gemini stopped in our tracks. Yes, sir, a clown, he said. 
There ain't one thing in this world I can do for folk about folks except laugh. So I'm going to join the circus and laugh my head off. You got it backwards, Dill, said Jim. Clowns are sad. It's folks that laugh at them. Well, I'm going to be a new kind of clown. I'm going to stand in the middle of the ring and laugh at all the folks. Just look at yonder, he pointed. Every one of them ought to be riding broomsticks. Aunt Rachel already does. So do you see the, 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 the images there between a uh, clown and witches? Right? So Dill's like, I'm going to be a clown and sit, stand around and laugh at all these people. And he's like, and then he talks about how how they are they all should be riding broomsticks. So this idea that they they appear to be one way, but inside they are very different. Miss Stephanie and Miss Rachel were waving wildly at us in a way that did not give the lie to Dill's observation. <laughs> That's funny too. Oh gosh, breathe, Jim. I reckon it'd be ugly not to see them. Something was wrong. Mr. Avery was red in the face from sneezing smell and nearly blew us off the sidewalk when we came up. Miss Stephanie was trembling with excitement, and Miss and Miss Rachel caught Dill's shoulder. You get you get on in the backyard and stay there, she said. There's danger coming. What's the matter? I asked. Ain't you heard yet? It's all over town. At that moment, Anne Alexander came to the door and called us, but she was too late. It was Miss Stephanie's pleasure to tell us. This morning, Mr. Bob Ewell stopped Atticus on the post office corner, spat in his face, and told him he'd get him if it took him the rest of his life. So, right, that heavy right there. So you've got this threat. It's not indirect. It's a direct threat. Bob Ewell finds Atticus, spits in his face. We're going to talk about that in the next chapter. Spits in his face and, sa and threatens him. Says, I'm going to get you if it takes me the rest of my life. Um, I want you to think about what it means to spit in someone's face. I want you to think about two things. I want you to think about what would it take for you to spit in someone's face, to be the one that does the spitting? And then, I mean, like how egregious of an act would that be? And then I want you to think about what would you do if someone spit in your face? Hmm. I'll see you for 23.